first thing I want to say is thank God for YouTube because we all now have this amazing resource to connect with the larger community about childhood trauma and educate ourselves on trauma. And, you know, when I was first thinking about putting up a video on YouTube about childhood trauma, I was just sort of curious about, like, who's talking about it? And one of the first people that popped up was now my good friend Anna Runkle, who does the crappy childhood fairy. Um, and that was a very inspiring experience for me to sort of see somebody talking about CPTSD, talking about emotional regulation, talking about their own experience in such an authentic and real way that I don't, I feel like it's really missing in the therapy world. So, um, you know, Anna and I connected and we decided to have a chat. We, we became friends in the last couple weeks and I was just um, honored to introduce her. If, you know, if you're not familiar with the Crappy Childhood Fairy, it's an amazing resource of self-regulation, exploring your own self-healing through CPSD and really looking at what happens to kids in these traumatic dysfunctional families, kind of like what, and she's the one that actually inspired me to start my own channel. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Anna, and we had a blast just kind of talking about our own wacky triggers. We talked about what it's like finding therapy in this day and age, um, and also just kind of how we both survived as kids, like looking at stuff like sort of looking at TV to feel like what's normal. So without further ado, here's my discussion with Anna. It's interesting, and maybe, you know, I relate to this, you probably relate to it as well, is, you know, not, how do I put this, is we feel bad, but we don't know why. We're really, you know what I mean? Have you ever, like, sort of, like, you're on a, a bus with somebody, you just don't really, you instantly don't like them, and you mm -hmm. sit away from them? Mm -hmm. Or sometimes that's good intuition or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's what I'm trying to explain, is, mm -hmm. like, as trauma survivors, we really, we're, we're kind of detached from these memories, and we're detached from our reality. So we just are, it's a little bit like we're just kind of a mess of emotions in real time without no meaning to it. And that begins with like a bad feeling, but I, you know, the concept of emotional flashbacks was an epiphany for me to understand like, what is this? Why have I woken up in such a terrible mood and feeling like the world's against me? And it was such a pattern. Mm. And when I finally had a name for it, it was great. But you're right, there is sort of a more subtle version of that there are certain things like about men in the 1970s, you know, the giant belt buckles and the handlebar mustache that are actually, they give me a bad feeling. And I've, I've had to consciously sure. work on it, you know, to, to um, be at right. peace with people, however they may dress, you know, <laughs> or shave or not. And, right. and to be at peace with people. And it's a kind of an obvious trigger. You know, I grew up in a commune and there were, you know, hippie guys and getting drunk and getting violent and smashing windows and things. And so mm. for a long time, I was well aware I was, I didn't like the sound of breaking glass. Uh, but then I was like, no, and like big mustaches and big thick belts and things. And totally. I don't even know what the memory is, but I just know it's, there's, it's just, it's loaded for me. Right. But there's so exactly. many things like that. I just wouldn't even know yeah. where to start. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. For me, like, um, this is a fascinating conversation. If I would drive through neighborhoods that reminded me of home, specifically if, if I drive by an old dive bar, because I grew up in bars, just, you know what I mean? Like, which is like the, you yeah. know, you they're just bars for bar flies. That's the what smell. the purpose. That like the, the, the beer and it, cigarette smell and disinfectant. The smell of it, the, you know what I mean? And it's just sort of like the... the <laughs> The, the real shitty Miller light sign that's like half lit neon, like that just gives me a vibe yes. and used to really give me a vibe. Yes. And sometimes, you know, it's interesting that um, we can drive through those neighborhoods and not know why we're bummed out. Right, right. And then have you, has your healing helped you to become more like neutral to just clues like that? There's random triggers like passing a bar, you can't avoid it. Yeah, right. Like, yes. And now it's sort of like, it's, it's now I just now I name th those are just things I don't like to hang out in. You know what I mean? Like, I hate malls. <laughs> yeah, I hate them anyway. I hate shopping. You know, I think a lot of people shopping do, is extremely I mean? triggering for me. Yeah, actually, right. You know, for the same kind of stuff. But yeah. nowadays, it's not, you know, it, this, it's like, um, it's, I, it's, I love that question. Um, I used to work jobs where I could be the superhero at the job, high stress. I worked inpatient psychiatry. You know what I mean? Like, and, and because my, like, you know, that, that old thing about trauma survivors really being good firemen or, or EMT people or whatever, 
that kind of stuff. But at this stage in my healing, I just know that those places, um, I don't get triggered about those places or those situations. I just know now that they're just not for me. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm going to lose my wellness. I'm going to lose my, my good vibes or my groundedness. If I go back to work in those jobs, I'm much better. <laughs> I'm kind of a crappy employee too. So, um, that like that that kind of stuff so i think these things change over time where my mentor and and her husband also say that you know when we go through some significant healing we lose interest in those stories where the bar used to give you the heebie-jeebies you know uh you know and now it's just kind of like uh it's just not a place for me i'm i'm disinterested in all that mess of it it drains so much energy to be triggered by something that's the thing. It's like you're carrying such a, when a trigger is active, you know, and you're just like, uh, Sucks. sort of going through it. It just, it just takes all the focus away. I used to say that having CPTSD yeah. was like wearing headphones and being stuck listening to ACDC really loud, but <laughs> pretending that I can hear you. And I'm very tuned into how you feel right now, but I can right. barely hear. Then a bunch I of people wrote and they said, I love ACDC. And I'm like, okay, well, I you don't like, <laughs> I don't right. dislike them, but I just mean it's really loud and and percussive right. and just like, I can't really be present. Yeah. Cause it's, I love around. the analogy. If we change that to Nickelback, I I'm more into the analogy cause I like AC <laughs> <laughs> or, or sugar Ray. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, well, we could but really that's go a on. really good analogy where, you know, there's so much going, there's so much trauma noise in our head. And I think as trauma survivors, we just have to like, um, much of it is just pretending that you're normal in the world when, when you don't feel that. Yeah, this is funny. This is a conversation I've never had, but like your odd triggers, like your smell of the bar. I know what you're talking about. And there's this bar smell with food in it that is a positive you know, memory because my dad took me to a bar all the time, a place in Berkeley called Brennan's. And it's yeah. finally gone, sadly. But I used to go there just to like smell that bar smell with roast beef in the air to feel yeah. his vibe and then my mom <laughs> this is very weird um but she her the bottom of her leather purse always had like tobacco in it and mints to cover up the smell of alcohol but like bits oh, wow. of tobacco from all her cigarettes getting smashed in there um over time right. and the smell of like mint and tobacco and leather together i'm like oh, mommy <laughs> i know right there, there's this right. alcoholism smell and it's um, I smell it when I go into a public bathroom sometime. This is kind of an icky thing, but some people might relate to this, but it's the smell of mm -hmm. renal failure, like mild renal failure. It like when people have peed in a public bathroom and their kidneys aren't working that well and there's been alcoholism, it has this certain smell. And that Absolutely. one, it's not positive, but I'm like, mom, is my mom here? Is my mom here? And right. So she, she died quite a long time ago, but later when I learned what that was, it's a smell of sick organs you know from alcoholism totally Very that, i mean it's yucky i'm sorry everybody but that's like that's when we talk about triggers it, it's a strong trigger for me and i never knew what it was as a kid but when i smelled it it means things are not okay you know we're in trouble now we are so unsafe right now absolutely for me <laughs> to continue the bodily i know i know exactly what you mean for me we grew up where the pets weren't taken care of yes or trained well and stuff so if i smell cat pee Yes. Like that can remind me of those sort of situations. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, I know a lot of this stuff is, I think like reclaiming that it's okay. It's okay now in the present. Do you know what I mean? Like if, if a cat pees on a rug, it's just like, that's just like kind of a normal pedantic part of life. Yeah. But it used to take us back to these really, but I think that that's what I mean about like what you just described to honor that is like, it really takes you back to um, a time in your life where I don't know what, you know, like if, if you were really young or whatever, where you shouldn't have been smelling that or seeing that or been exposed to all that. But it's just like it also, I think, and smells are very powerful. Um, the it, it, it takes us right back to sort of like the emergency of it, the dissociation of it. You know, I was in a group therapy with someone that um, had a very violent, violent alcoholic, you know, like quasi homeless father that would pop in and pop out. And he did something called an experiential, 
and this may this may seem kind of radical, but in the in the group work that I do and, and that I was doing back then, um, is in the experiential we bring up the, ex, the the trauma experience in a good enough way, and he created this kind of like um, almost like Halloween straw man kind of dummy of his dad, and he poured like the specific alcohol all over it to get the smell, the cigarettes, and it's those tactile things. I know this sounds this sounds intense because it is intense. Those tactile things get the person triggered back to their trauma. But then in the therapy session, we try to have a different outcome. Oh, how do you do that? Because to me, it's to me, it's having had the, difficulty yeah. in therapy, it feels like, oh, that's you're treading on thin ice there, Patrick. What? <laughs> I know. And I kind of wanted to ask you about that because I know you don't do a lot of like work around like dysregulation. And being able to sort of as best as you can, you know, or knowing when the judgment call is how much of it is too much, you know, right. And for those people doing that work is there was a whole year and a half of group work of cultivating safety and knowing about what happens to our inner child. And when somebody is preparing their own experientials that way, like, like a role play that I do or a rescue for a terrified child or doing some rage work there's a lot of slow lead up to that point. This, it's not just like week two, it's like, okay, make a dummy of your dad. And like, you know what I mean? Bring in the Paul Malls and you know what I mean? Like the really cheap generic brand whiskey and you know what I mean? And his bad attitude and bring him in tomorrow. Long, long, slow wind up to that. But the different outcome is we might um, have group members kind of arrest the dad and get him out of there. Wow. Or have a social work come in or a therapist come in or somebody really takes care of their inner child. And then it's, I mean, what's wild about it is the subconscious doesn't know that it's not real. We're bringing up the trigger trauma brain essentially. And then we're doing work while that's triggered to cultivate what should have happened. That dad gets taken off to jail that the other siblings get some care, that the person's inner child um, gets some simply debriefing. You know, it was scary to be around your dad when he was drunk like that. So, prof you know, like that's where, um, and it, it, you know, when the person walks away is, well, it's very scary to do. They're super nervous to do that kind of work. There's a lot of prep work. I might be working with them for a couple weeks about sort of prepping this experiential or something like that. I did one, um, and I know not everyone's trauma is about alcoholism or growing up in bars or cigarettes. Sometimes you might have a, a you know, perfectly pretty household white picket fence, but no one can do emotions and someone's a covert narcissist or, you know what I mean? Or it doesn't have to be that. But in my own group work, um, when I was struggling with drugs and alcohol myself, I did an experiential around, I brought in the six pack that my mother drank and her brand of cigarettes. And I did a whole experiential about giving back what she exposed me to because I was taught those coping strategies from her. So I think that that's what I mean. Like when you, when you smell that stuff in a bathroom and it takes you right back is that's what I mean about the triggers telling telling us that we might benefit from doing some work down the road about those things. Oh, how interesting. I I counted. I've seen 11 therapists in my life, and I've talked to, on this channel about the experience a lot, about my need to yeah. find a different way forward because, to my knowledge, none of them had this themselves, and they had an outsider's understanding of what some of these problems are. Plus it was pre, you know, so much has emerged in the last 10 years about this being a neurological phenomenon. We're not just like, you know, unconsciously holding on to stuff. Like our brains got yeah. hurt and it's very hard to manage really. when your brain is kind of limping right. along. So I'm We're really into the brain healing the piece past, of it. Man. Hmm? Sorry about that. We're holding on to the past. Yeah, man. I'm, yeah. I'm trying to recreate my childhood, and I'm just trying to avoid love or something. And I was just like, I, right. I think that's not true, though. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'd like to have a good life now, and of course, I'd like to be loved. I just keep making the same weird mistake over and over again, and I can't see it coming, and I don't know why, and mm -hmm. I'm ashamed, and 
and you know, as good as my therapists were, they would just be baffled by my behavior, you know, my continuing to make the same mistake and the way I was so defensive and angry about it, where I seemed so reasonable before. But now I, I just was so mm. liberated when we learned about the brain injury of, of complex trauma, that there's neurological changes, that certain things become very hard, that your reasoning gets hampered when you're under stress and your emotions get bigger. And like that right there explained it, but just knowing like it's physiological, I'm not doing this on purpose and I can't help it. And it's not my fault. So true. It's not right. my fault. And that was, you know, people had told me all the time, your parents' problems were not your fault. And even when I was four, I knew that. I didn't take that on. But it's just like, why am wow. I so screwed up? Mm -hmm. Why do I keep, you know, acting weird? I'm, I've am um, i just made plans to go see um, a cousin and an aunt who I haven't seen in many years. And most of my extended mm -hmm. family is out of touch with me. And I've never mm -hmm. known why. And I always have this like shame attack feeling. It's like it's because of the mistakes I used to make which I'm not really sure they even know completely about, but, <laughs> but um, sure. I don't know if I'm going to talk to them about it. Like that just never feels safe to me to go talk to normal people about it and be like, you know, is there some reason why you stop talking to me? But I guess, I don't know mm -hmm. why this, for whatever reason, this is coming up right now, but um, I mm -hmm. had a, um, some kids in my family, the, their parents lost custody of them. Eventually they got custody back. But when that happened, it was this huge crisis and I was the only person who could help at all. And I could only take one kid and it was very hard to make happen. So I fostered a child from my own family and um, totally destructive to my relationship to the other, to the parents who I had previously been close to. And it was this really hard situation. But when I knew what was what were the kids were going through, both before they were removed and especially after actually when they were in foster care, I would have done mm -hmm. anything, you know, I just would have done anything. I just would never want a kid to have to be in a rough situation like that. And right. and right now, the thought of seeing my <laughs> an aunt, it's coming up now. I'm like, why didn't you do something? Why didn't you do something? Surely you knew. Oh. I've talked to like friends, parents. I'd be like, I don't know if you know this, but you know, my mom was an alcoholic and there was all this violence going on and they were like, oh yeah, no, we knew. Yeah. <laughs> but in those days, you know, what do you do? Right. What do you do? They knew. And what they did do right is there were a lot of um, teachers and friends, parents who came in and like, they're like, you want to come over? You want to go to summer camp with us? Would you like to learn to knit? How about if I paid for ice skating lessons for you and my daughter? You know? Right. It's all like sort of passive addressing I mean, it's, you know what I mean? I it don't helped. want to take it away. Yeah. It's not, it's not, I think every kid in that situation, um, I know exactly what you mean. You know, like I, I, you know, I can't tell you how many clients have said the same thing where, you know, they reconnect with an aunt years later at Thanksgiving or something like that. It's like, like sort of like, oh, you know, I told, even in my own family, like, you know, someone said like, well, I told your mom not to marry your dad. You know, that in that case, it's sort of it's sort of an example of someone seeing it at the time, you know, which is a clue and it's helpful for my own processing. But there's so many sort of like, oh, we knew you were in trouble. We just what were we going to do? Well, there's there's a, and something that to that. It is very hard to intervene. Yeah. It's hard. Yes, there is a society kind of problem there. Mm -hmm. But so <laughs> but son of a bitch, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just sort of. There are other people who um, profoundly, you know, I was on TikTok and I, you know, somebody was saying, they were sort of saying, I took in my three, my three-year-old nephew because I knew my brother was like a heroin addict and abusive. And I knew, I knew that the mom was really sort of in, in, in really bad shape or similar or, or hitting him or whatever. And no questions asked. I just kind of, essentially, I just took him, you know, and I got custody and he just went off to college yesterday. <laughs> so those stories like really make me well up and sort of, but coming back to your question is um, what, you know, in a way it's like, unless I just think that unless that person is insightful or safe or, or whatever is um, and sometimes it's almost like we have to just let the, let there be an elephant in the room if it's not going to kind of go anywhere, but I, I do know what you mean. 
Well, <laughs> it'll be interesting when, um, if, if anybody asks me, I mean, one thing about my family is there isn't, these, these people are pretty cool. I think it's going to, I haven't seen them in a long time, so I don't know what to expect, but by and large, my family never asks about my life. If I, if, if I ever do have contact with them, it's that kind of family, right? I don't think people necessarily know what I do for a living or anything, but if it comes up, then I'll say, oh, you know, I have this thing called crappy childhood fairy. And that's sort of, you can't help but sort of open the can of worms. <laughs> then I'm like, we are. childhood, like, did someone have not, one of those? The rest of the world about what happened to us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But of course, like so many families, it's, um, you know, the older generation had trauma too on that side, for sure. They, they yeah. I think they had an alcoholic dad. I never met him. He died very young. Um, and they were so poor. They were so poor. They had to worry about food all the time. And right. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, in a way, I think um, these families are really tricky and related to that trauma in a way that you might want to talk about it with them, but there might be a part of them that wants to, too, but doesn't know how. Yeah. You know, just I think that, like, when you think about the generations of you know, uh, just thinking about like, the, you know, despite who my parents were about what their trauma, you know, like where it's fascinating to be alive in this time of day that someone can look at this conversation between you and I, like an 18 year old and can be like, you can talk about that. You can talk about growing up in a bar or you can talk about that your dad was slimy or you can go there is blows my mind because when you and I were 18, you know, I was lucky enough to land with a therapist who was really good and could help me. And like, she, she could just see it on my face about what I went through. And she's the one that drew it out of me. But now people have these resources and that, you know, what, what we can and we can't talk about, you know, or acknowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And, you and when you and I were chatting the other day and you said something mm -hmm. about, we were talking, we were like, Oh, let's talk about, you know, what's a good trauma therapist, which I, I do want to talk about, but you oh, had okay, been sure. saying, Oh, they have to ask about the trauma. And it's funny. What I was reflecting on afterwards was I used to have to make a rule with therapists and say, I'll give you this much time to talk about my family. But at a certain point, I insist we begin to talk about my life because I'm sick and tired of it always being about my mom. <laughs> You know? Yeah. Oh, okay. And, right. And mm -hmm. I always felt like, um, and I've, I, this is, I, I used to say it's like um, my family drama porn. It was like, that's such a harsh way of putting it, but it's like something that people couldn't look at, like therapists couldn't look away and it was so compelling and it was so like, oh, wow, you, surely we, you want and need to talk about that. And after 11 therapists, I had talked about it. In my case, what was yeah. really helpful was to like stop talking about it after a certain point and bring the focus in because right. I was spending decades like talking about what happened to me rather than um, yes. including or moving on to like, but what what's going on here? Because I was starting to make grave mistakes, you know, the older I got that were really, mm -hmm. you know, a real source of trauma too. And I call it, you know, that's, I talk about that a lot in my work. It's like when you grew up traumatized and dysregulated, you end up with these habits and patterns and stuff like, you know, I don't know, I smoked, I smoked heavily. I lashed out at people. Yeah, sure. Stuff like that was really causing a lot of problems for me. And so talking about my mom wasn't helping me solve those problems. In theory, maybe if we had gotten far enough, but we were working on this assumption that if we just talked for enough years about what had happened, that I would have some breakthrough. And instead of like feeling better or feeling closer, I was going down. And there was this myth happening of like, well, it's going to feel worse before it gets better. But it's like for six years, you know, I was like, oh, I felt like I was afraid I wasn't going to make it. Right. It makes me think about a couple things. The first thing is I think that there is a, uh, and I think therapists, you know, I think of the old guard, like sort of psychoanalysis, 60s and 70s and 80s or, or people they assume there's like a Hollywood idea of what that is. Do you know what I mean? Like, like year 12 of two times a week, then someone says like, oh, my mother wasn't capable of love. Or they didn't, you know, they, they, my mother loved the idea of me, not the real me. Yeah. And there's this- I see it like, now, I'm healed. 
you know, and there's just some like, you know, like, and then the therapist would like, you know, like sort of sports, you know, the tweed thing with the arm, with the arm patches. So like, well, you've done amazing work here and then you're cured, you know, like it's such a, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. And it also makes me think about what uh, for about uh, four years between an internship and a, and a job, I worked with veterans and every time a veteran would get reintroduced to the system about whether they had they needed a psych eval or whatever or needed a new therapist or whatever there would be this person asking them psychosocial assessment where do you live what was your childhood like what are your current things and the veteran would have to repeat this three to four times a year yes to the point that it was just you know, they, they, they would get enraged, which I, you know what I mean? I even hated asking them, you know what I mean? I, I started, I started breaking the rules and just copying and pasting about stuff because to ask them again, yes. Well, first of all, it's very much like medical system stuff and just sort of like, it's just whatever, but it made me think about your experience. But I, when I got to therapy, it was sort of, we started talking about my family instantly but I was being trained to use my story to make my present better right out of the gates. There was a certain context about what it was being used. And even people who do my groups, they have the same point. Like, you know, why, Patrick, why are we still talking about my mother? They were in like year two and a half in this group. Can we, can I just move on? And like, you know, like, I just want to find, um, a soulmate and move on with my life and have a kid and, you know, like whatever. And I'm sort of say like, well, I think we should keep talking about your mother because you keep sabotaging your relationships. And it's not like I'm in a power struggle with them. It's just sort of like, even, even my own clients get sick about talking about it, but it, it's not good to keep beating in that dead horse unless there's a rhyme and reason to it. I agree. I agree. And it was that myth. I'm thinking of the movie Good Will Hunting. It's a great movie, but that scene where where yeah, Matt Damon fault. and Robin Williams, it's like he finally admits what the pain is. And then he's like, he had a breakthrough and he's all healed. I, yep. saw, I saw that, what, how long ago, however long ago. That's when I was in the middle of things. And 99. I remember feeling that way. Every time I had somebody, somebody would say, oh, therapy's great. I had such a great experience. I'd be like, yeah. What, how is that supposed to happen? Like, but that just knowing that like doesn't do it for me. And yeah. and I suppose that's well, where I, finding out about dysregulation was so helpful to sort of fill in that gap. Like, a person yeah. like me cannot process just just talking to me and me saying stuff. I could say anything. I could see it in that session, but by the time I'm out of there, because of dysregulation, right. I can't even form a memory of it. That's what I love about your channel. Because what I find is people who had similar experiences to you in therapy. Incidentally, I hit the lottery about finding someone yeah. good at 19. Yeah. I and love hearing is, about this. Not, what, I, what I've learned over the years is like most people don't have that experience in therapy. So I just happen to, you know what I mean? Yeah. Whatever, whatever yeah. It is, and I'm eternally grateful for it. You've but been what, picked. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have. I think you're well, uniquely gifted for what you're doing right now to share this with people, to have gone through it yourself and then to professionally help people have that experience of breaking through their trauma is like what finally all that suffering means something now because now this is a superpower. Thank you. But I always come back to my mentor because it wasn't when people would see her, it became, you have to see this woman. Like I got to her through word of a mouth referral by someone who just really trusted her. So it, she was just really good at what she did, but people really really saw safety in her much like a safe mom that they had never there was just something about her but in in you like what i hear is when when a client comes to me they'll say what you're saying i've been to 11 people some of them helpful some of them not and it never concluded do you know what i mean like they would always be asking about my dad or or even not some of the other was like not going there at all and what I love about your channel or what I love about sort of like the, the sort of a, a movement of social media or this kind of stuff is some people are trying to heal, heal themselves because the services are not out there. And let's be blunt, they're not out there. It's, There's very little of it and it's expensive and most people don't have that kind of, those resources and most health right. plans aren't going to help with it. And so 
Now right. there's YouTube. <laughs> right. And even well-meaning therapists cannot be sort of trained. Yeah. Or, uh, you know what I mean? Or yeah. they're working from a place of, you know, and I don't want to like poop, like there are some really great therapists yeah. out there. Yeah. I don't want to invest on, on the field, but I think that the field needs a lot of work when it comes to people's stories or how much too soon. I think so too. And um, I think that there's a lot of work going on right now in early childhood intervention, which is fantastic. So that in the future, hopefully yes. there'll be fewer people like me who yep. don't even get to get any help till they're an adult. Um, but mm -hmm. <laughs> but I saw, another thing I see going on right now is it's kind of a popular topic. There's a lot of sort of grant funding to do some kind of intervention. And so you have a lot of people who have taken some kind of continuing education credit you know, for trauma informed care and, and it could be anything. And that's, you know, I have, I have a professional history as a, um, you know, analyst <laughs> of, of research oh. and I look at right. it and that's one of the things that's always disturbed me is it's, it's not very transparent. So when people say, go find a good therapist, it's like, what is that? How would you even know what that is? What are the markers? Is it reported anywhere? If somebody, you know, <laughs> is actually really successful at helping people with trauma. And that's one of the things that I think YouTube and social yeah. media, ha as much as they carry a lot of problems, a lot of negativity, it sure. does help It does help people who know what to do become visible to ordinary people who can now find them. It's not just like behind this giant curtain like it used to be. There was no way Absolutely. to know. So I wanted right. to ask you, Patrick, like yeah. what, for somebody who's thinking, I'm going to try therapy or I'm going to try a new therapist, what should they be looking for? Yeah. Um, sort of, do you mean in general or do you mean for, sort of for childhood trauma? Yeah, for childhood trauma, for this thing that hasn't right. been very well cared for in the past and is rarely handled sure. well, it's emerging. Right. And this is good information for the therapist listening too, like what skills right. to cultivate, what awareness to cultivate. Sure. For the therapists who are interested in providing childhood trauma, I really have a strong opinion about this is don't do it unless you've done significant work yourself. If you're going to go into that field or go into that world, I think you have to kind of talk the walk and really have some mastery over your own childhood before you start working with other people. You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and I want to be fair there. Like that can be even hard. It's hard. It's hard for general population people to find a childhood trauma therapist. It's hard for therapists. Do you know what I mean? But I really think for before a therapist wants to get into that is to really not approach it like sort of like, oh, depression's interesting. You know, you know, do some research, do some maybe do some mindfulness, ECT and that kind of don't don't approach it from a an academic kind of place. All of um, what I do, who I am as a YouTube person or therapist or whatever, came from my experience in therapy, not from my master's program, mm -hmm. not from any really trainings, is I kind of went into getting a license and I already knew kind of what I, I just wanted to do what my mentor did in that I was like a sponge for that model. So there's that. But for people who are seeking um, a trauma therapist is, um, hard, they're hard to find, you know, it's, if anyone's listening, if you want to create an amazing website, create a national reserve of vetted childhood trauma therapist and make that website. Don't go into it as a, as a moneymaker, <laughs> just go into it as, do you know what I mean? Like here, you know, here they all are. And it'd be amazing if people could sort of vet therapist or whatever, and then have them be, you know, you, if you're in Michigan, you want to find somebody, boom, there they are. So, because most people go on psychology today and then they just type in by, oh, I have blue cross and I live in this zip code. And I think that this is the best way to answer your question. Then it's not wrong to assume this. And this is what's sad about it. Most people, if you're 22 and you do that zip code and then the health insurance, then there's the assumption of, I can talk to these people about my mom and they'll know what that is. And that's probably wrong. Most of those people, some of them might, but a lot of them won't or won't know how. So given that problem is I really tell, because I think most people, and I'm sorry to be so long winded. I just moved and I needed to find a new primary care doctor. Right. And I called um, a local sort of hospital system 
Do you have any pay, pay, you know, physicians taking new clients? Yes, we do. They're over here. You know, and then I said, do they take my insurance? And they're like, we don't know. Call your insurance. <laughs> so I call my insurance and I confirm all that and do all that. If I'm struggling, like just I'm not, but you know, it doesn't matter. But if I was struggling with diabetes, I can put good money that that person's going to know how to treat my potential diabetes. It's not the same with therapists. So what I what I tell people is to really read the profiles, and if if a therapist says I work with couples, families, uh, bipolar, mindfulness, I do this, I do that, and their list is so long. That tells you they're trying to cover too many bases. Do you want to find the person who is sort of saying childhood stuff, mm -hmm. trauma issues, and they're not covering all of these bases? So yeah, right? if that was a rant, I just have, have a strong opinion, and it's because it's really frustrating to find somebody. Yeah, that's such a good point, point. and I think there's hardly anybody who doesn't put PTSD in their profile. I've noticed. Yes. Looking around, so everybody puts it, but really do you, and, and then CPTSD is a separate thing. And, right. and it's, it's, it's yes. not totally the same thing and understanding that. And, and then even people who are deep into the topic, they're going to have different approaches. This is, yeah. this is why when I, when people ask me, what should they look for? I say, well, first of all, first make yourself sovereign to this. You don't have to like hand over control of your healing to somebody just because they take your insurance. Very true. And Very even true. if they could heal you, they, you know, like, well, they can't like nobody. Mm -hmm. I think I feel like there's in it's in healthcare generally, but in mental health care, there's a little bit of this paradigm of like, we deliver healing to you. It's like, well, you deliver attention and and professional experience, but the healing happens within through, you know, and you get some help with that. And so what I mm -hmm. I read my YouTube comments and I know, I bet, I know you, you, you know, sure. you learn so much about like the human condition by reading what people are writing there. Yeah. And so many people I've noticed, particularly in the UK, for example, when they, when it's identified that they have childhood trauma, they go on a list to get access to a trauma informed therapist. And it could be like yep. two years, but then they yep. have this perception that healing has now been prevented for two more years. And I always say to them, it's oh, like, yeah, that's, that's too bad. Person. But first of all, you don't know that that person is actually going to be able to be your person. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it may not be a fit. And right now you can start doing self-led things to start healing. You do not have right. to have a therapist for every part of your healing. Like it's, it's, some, it's a special thing. That's not like anything else, but honestly, my strongest, my, you know, my strongest tools, it's this for me, because for me, Mm -hmm. negative hamster wheel thinking is is a lot the form my trauma takes and when it starts mm -hmm. kicking up the thoughts i can't tell which thing comes first i go a little bit unconscious when i'm triggered or when i'm getting dysregulated but i have some mm -hmm. really telltale signs my nose goes numb and like when we got on the phone this this morning to start taping my nose was a little bit numb and i i just kind of did my i did my drill so it's like come back come back <laughs> yeah, nervous system sure. activate right. on not right. off <laughs> i know what you mean you know <laughs> to bring it I'm back because i and knowing how to do that is like a it's it's so powerful and had i known this when i used to go to therapy i could have gotten so much more value out of that very expensive hour you know each time if yes. i had known how to stay in my body if they had known how to recognize that right. i was you know kind of like you know falling away from presence Right. One other thought, and I, I know what you mean, like every <laughs> related to what you just said, I'm a musician and every time, you, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty good musician until you put a mic in front of me. Because I think when either a camera or a mic on me or, or starting with somebody or, or you sitting across from a therapist is I think our body starts to feel attacked because I think in childhood to be seen was to be attacked. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's what that is. And But coming back to a little bit about finding the therapist is I tell people, if you can get the therapist on the phone about a potential session, ask them, how do they work around childhood trauma? And if you get, uh, well, I'm trauma informed and I like to use mindfulness or something like that. And that's fine and good. Again, I'm not poo-pooing that is I'm saying you want to be looking for a response. If someone were to ask me of that, like, well, how do you work with childhood trauma? 
then my spiel kicks in about sort of like, well, I'm, I work from an inner child perspective. I think, you know, or if you don't like that term inner child, amygdala, hippocampus, the trauma brain, the inner child looks at the present through the lens of childhood. And we do a lot of connecting the dots between the two. And a lot of sort of, you know, as you, as we sessions go on, we talk more and more about shifting out of the unfinished business from our, you know, like that's like a canned, I'm immediately going to be talking about that because that's my gig. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm passionate about. Do you know what I mean? If it, but if, uh, I guess, you know, and I, I know it's so much needle in the haystack, haystack stuff, but you know, we don't have to ask it like a general physician to sort of say, well, how do you approach diabetes? Because they all have a systemic, you know what I mean? They all probably hopefully have a training about getting your insulin checked and looking at things and blood work, and then maybe looking at a treatment protocol. And it's pretty cut and dry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so comforting for me to hear you say this about to, saying specifically where you're coming from. Of course, there are different approaches and different approaches work better for different people. And if we could, as a person who needs help, we can tune yes. in, like, does this speak to me or not? Does this speak to me? Is this calling yeah. to me? Is it comforting to me to hear somebody talk about yeah. how they approach it? Yes. And, and I want to be clear. Go, go well, ahead. I was just going to say, when you said mindfulness, there is a lot of that. And I know mindfulness is a really important tool for a lot of people. Yes. But I feel like the people who believe like that's going to be sufficient for CPTSD obviously don't have CPTSD. It's, you know, it's a, it's a little thing in the context right. of a lot of things, even though right. for, for everybody, like stopping and being more mindful is helpful. Like it's just so much more than that. And so that is, yes. that is a trigger word for me, mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Right. I know. Yeah. Like, and I, uh, I want to be clear, like, I don't want to throw other clinicians yeah. or therapists, or life coaches or healers. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. Yeah. So it's not my intent to sort of, you know, to sort of do that. But I yeah. think that if you're, if for anyone's listening, if they're seeking that is, you know, I want to say to people's inner child, you have the right to ask questions. Yeah. You have the right to discern about how it's going to go. The other piece to it too, is that it's not going to work unless you like the therapist. <laughs> it's not going to work unless you like the person and there's good vibes kind of going on there. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's just, it is, it is kind of really tricky and really hard um, in that way. The other piece is like when I was 19 and got the therapist, I could have benefited from a mindfulness person for six months to regulate my system. I'm not saying it's all bad. I'm just sort of saying like those things are really, really good. Yeah. Sometimes clients come to me and they, you know, if I ask them, have you been in therapy before? They might say, I was with somebody for a year and a half. They helped me through my divorce, but that but we didn't really get into childhood trauma. Amazing. Or we did CBT for a while and that really helped with my depression. I just want something deeper. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, but I also get, you know, like, well, I, kept going to this person and I just was just, they just stared at me blankly for six months and I just didn't want to go through the rigmarole of finding a new one. That sucks. Yeah, it does. It does. I'm sort of a, I'm a, I'm a connoisseur of things that are regulating. And um, I was taught mm -hmm. mindfulness techniques when I was in high school, really. I don't think it was called that yet, but but uh, mm -hmm. luckily, because of like acting classes and things, I had teachers who were teaching meditation practices and also, you know, the mirror game in theater. It's, you're actually getting very regulated and following along with somebody. It turns out What's there are the all these regulating practices that have been with us for thousands of years. Oh, sure. What's the mirror game? <laughs> but I, I'm always curious about them and how to use them. And so a lot of, uh, in the early days when I was first trying to recover and not finding help through everything, I just found that for me, I, I've noticed some people have a very sort of body-based dysregulation and that's the place where you begin. So it's stuff like yoga, you know, or somatic type things help. Uh, my body tends to be kind of triggery and the place, the easier place, the easier entrance point is through language and thinking and writing. And, and there's, and yeah. I, I've noticed, you know, now I have the pleasure of friendship and camaraderie with so many people who have what I have and all of us, you know, for, for me and them, it's been this experience of like, 
no one's ever described what I have. And when I first started saying my experience, people would mm -hmm. say, I have that too. And I would just cry. I'm like, you're kidding. You have it too. And every time somebody tells me that they relate to something I put out in a video, some experience of what it's like, right. I'm so moved to find out because every time it takes another layer off of self attack, it right. just takes another layer off of self attack, you know, like, so it's yeah. not my fault. So right. I couldn't have helped it. So this is a common pattern of how, how normal kids become adults and, and struggle a little bit. It's like, they're, it's like almost cookie cutter sometimes, you know, the way yeah. it plays out. And that was such a relief to be off the hook and to just know I have a normal reaction to an abnormal injury. Yeah. And that is, yeah. Um, yeah. to have that understood by each other. So many of us say to each other, you've done more for me than anybody ever has only by just reflecting back. You have that too. You have that too. And then, right. and then people share knowledge about how, you know, how did you get mm -hmm. over it? So now I'm learning about all the possibilities out there of how to do it. And some people are also doing a sort of um, mechanistic approach where it's like stimulation of the vagus nerve or, you know, <laughs> or right. um, mm -hmm. movement techniques. There's so many ways that people are coming at it. And so mm -hmm. it's also really, mm -hmm increased my open-mindedness and respect for what works um, yeah. that people are different and it, it re, it's going to require helpers and professionals who have different approaches and who can name it and who can take those approaches yeah. seriously and not just think that childhood is trauma is something that everybody just understands off the bat. Right. But to also understand that, you know, um, I want to come back to you said something about, can I ask, what was that thing you mentioned about mirroring in theater when you were a kid? Oh, what was yeah. That? Have you ever played the mirror game? You stand and face somebody, you get assigned to somebody. It's when you're in high school and you feel like you have a fat stomach, it's just torture. You know, you have, somebody's <laughs> looking at you, but you, you know, one person puts their hand up and the other person mirrors it and puts it right there. And so you follow each other along. And when I look back, mm -hmm. I think, oh yeah, first, for being on stage, you want to be aware of your body and your movements. And it's an exercise to tune in and tune into another person. Yeah. But actually from a nervous system point of view, no wonder I loved theater. No wonder I loved theater. Right. It was, it was all like, about presence. And intimacy. That's intimate. <laughs> it's That's painfully intimate. intimate. It's what I call Painful. fire hose intimacy. Also like when my dad would, my dad died of ALS when I was a teenager. And he, um, he had always been a very loving dad for all, for all the problems we had as a family. And I didn't get to have as much time with him as I would have liked, but, but, uh, he would, he would always let me know that he thought I was wonderful and he loved me. And that was totally positive for me. But when he, mm. when he was dying and he had a throat tube and, you know, he could barely talk because of the ALS and he go, I love you so much. It would be like, it'd be like somebody shining a cleave light in my face. Like it was so much love. I couldn't even handle it. Right. And, and I couldn't, I, I got very shut down from the trauma that I had been going through and I couldn't receive that love. And brilliantly, I don't know if it was mm -hmm. just me or maybe his spirit has helped out. I don't know, but mm. his love seems to have been like time capsuled for me and received in my forties when I was raising young kids. And wow. I went, wow, my dad loved me so much. And, and that helped me understand how how the CPTSD response is actually so genius sometimes, you know, it does, it preserves, you know, it gives you a coping mechanism. It's like, I'm shutting down. I feel nothing. I might have to do drugs or, you know, do reckless things in order to feel something right now. Mm -hmm. But when I'm ready and situations, right, I'm going to come back out and it's going to be a little bit hard, but I'm coming back out and I'm going to, you know, that's like the word recover. I'm going to recover yeah. that full awareness that I was meant to have. And that's right. what I think is so exciting about recovery. We're not just trying to feel better. We're trying to come back, come into bloom in a way that we never have before with all that stuff that was tucked away by trauma packed up. Yeah. Right. For me, we, we, we had different experiences, but the same thing for me, I got that from group. Um, and then later like 12 step meetings about being in a community. Cause like, yeah, again, I think the theme to what we're talking about, about when I, was say four years old and around my dad who was sort of scary. It wasn't safe to be visible. So I think that our, our, our CPTSD is like repression of ourselves, repression of our emotions. And then 
I think the body freaks out when we try to reverse that process and be present or whatever. So there's a lot of, I think that that's maybe what recovery is, is like tolerating. Yeah. You know what I mean? Tolerating more and more intimacy and tolerating more sort of stuff. But I'm also fascinated by like, can you tell me more about like what, what other self-regulation things, you know what I mean? Like really worked for you Well, as the year progressed, you know? Yeah. I think in my twenties, I was able to, uh, I feel like my CPTSD, it's sort of like, I don't have alcoholism, but I'm very affected by alcoholism, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I learned in 12 step recovery myself about how alcoholism is progressive and fatal. Like a person could stop drinking and sure. everything would be great. And then, you know, 15 years later they drink again and their alcoholism is much progressed. And mm, that's, that's true. I feel like CPTSD is like that, that, that it, it requires, um, for me a daily maintenance and that I, when I start having good days, mm -hmm. I'm like, Oh, I don't really need to use my tools or do anything. Cause I'm, I'm healed now. I'm good. I've got this nice husband, you know, everything's great. But actually what happens when I don't stay in my sort of daily routine and the stuff that I do to support myself, yeah. which includes techniques, but also connecting with people like lockdown has really taught me how sensitive mine and a lot of people's CPTSD symptoms are to isolation. Right. And it's a self, mm -hmm. you know, it's like a, it's a bad spiral because you start isolating and then you can't deal with people. You can't tolerate, right. It's, yeah. it's just so triggering. And so whatever the triggers are. So, so for me, part of my routine for regulation involves things that are sometimes out of my comfort zone, like participating, speaking up, not speaking up, <laughs> like learning to just have a little bit of like choice about mm. that. And so I'm not like lashing out, mm. but nor am I um, sitting there suffering in silence and getting elegant. Mm. I, I had a gathering at my house the other night and some guests got a little bit heated in a discussion about something. Oh, wow. And I saw other guests sort of shifting in their chair. And yeah, in right. my heart, I was thinking, um, I'm starting to get triggered. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if everybody else is getting triggered, but I still had my capacity, you know, because I'd used my techniques yeah. before the party, you know, faithfully. Mm -hmm. But I, I just was like, before I get triggered and before everybody else gets triggered, I need to find an elegant way to sort of like calm this situation without being super codependent, without being controlling, without shaming the people who are getting a little bit heated, you know, because right. it is, it's a party that I have periodically for people to discuss things and it's wonderful, but mm -hmm. of course it's going to get heated sometimes and people feel strongly. And, um, mm -hmm. and they're good people and they wouldn't be there if I didn't have faith in them. So we had had a presenter and I went over to her and I put my hand on her shoulder because she was presenting and some people sort of digressed and were getting heated. And I put my hand on her shoulder and it's what I, it's what would help me a hand on the shoulder, just like ground me, please come, you know, mm -hmm. call me back. And she's a young person who had prepared a lot for the presentation she gave for people to discuss. And mm -hmm. um, I put my hand on her. And I just said, I really want to hear what our presenter was going to say. Would, would everybody be okay with that? Could we hear that? And when I went to bed that night, I was telling my husband, I was like, you, I am so proud of myself. Like I didn't freak out. I was a good hostess. Yeah. I took care of the presenter. I took care of the people who were getting heated and everything kind of like naturally shifted. And later um, as the party was winding down, people were chatting with each other and saying that was kind of intense. I was worried, but then it got better. And I was just like, nobody knows my private victory that I was able to be part of the sort of thing. People getting heated mm -hmm. and yelling is like, used to be just kryptonite for me. It just would ruin wow, everything. I and I would be likely to either yes. totally shut down and never want to see those people again, or yeah. lash out and say things that were way more intense than I meant for them to come out and damage my relationships with him. So the minute I get triggered, I go into terror. I'm going to ruin my relationships. I'm going to ruin my social circle. No one's ever going to like put up with me again. So there's this thing. I was so proud of myself. So people on my channel know I, 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 I use a technique. I've used it 27 years. It was taught to me by this young woman who was pretty fresh off the streets who had learned it in AA. She taught me how to write my fears and resentments on paper and then ask for them to be removed. And at that time, like asking at some kind of a higher power was just like, and she's just like, <laughs> well, you told me that you feel like dying. So, you know, if you want what, to try what I do, I would recommend you just pretend there's something that will help you with this because what else are you going to do? Right. 
And at that yeah. time I was in therapy three times oh, a week. Gosh. So I had that piece. So she taught me to do that. And it was like so powerful for me. Right. My mind, it took about two weeks for my mind to kind of like snap into place like Legos. I just like all of a sudden I could focus, I could hear the headphones with ACDC came off, you know, so to speak. And, wow. and I could be yeah. present, but then I had yes. a lifetime of habits and self-defeating behaviors to start to understand and work with. So it didn't like getting regulated was the beginning, but I, I grew up poor. I grew up in a house with right. violence. I grew up with a lot of shame. I sought regulation through stuff like, you know, um, you know, stupid sexual relationships when I was too young and had no idea what was going on and felt, got very hurt by them. Like a lot of things I, or smoking pot or, you know, all the things that I used to seek out for regulation either um, were ultimately self-destructive or they just weren't sufficient. And the writing yeah. for me, I follow it with a really simple meditation that those two things were enough to put me up on the playing field to start having choices about like, what conversation am I going to have right now? How will I choose to deal with it if somebody insults me? Yeah. Just start right. having a choice about it. It's been a, For you know, some... it's it's a never ending process. So I don't want to talk mm -hmm. about it like, and then everything was Cinderella, but it's of course not. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but once well, I could so stay wired. regulated, I was a human being again. <laughs> yeah. We're so wired in a similar way. I call it that, you know, um, and also going to 12 step is I matured in 12 step. I think the group therapy work was very healing for me, but I kind of really grew up in those ideas mm -hmm. and I would learn, I think a lot of recovery is just learning healthier ideas from healthier people. Yeah. So I just think having a community or having people to bounce stuff off of. And then I love what you, that victory you were talking about, because if I was in your shoes, there was a time in my life where I would go and become the mayor. You know what I mean? And like work, well, you know, let's, let's, well, we got crisis. We got to work this out, you know, just kind of take over. And in a way that people didn't need that from me, like your guests, they didn't need an intervention. You know, they didn't need someone to take over or get reactive or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like, it makes me think about um, the part of me that like had to, and I'm sure you did too, of just had to make shit happen because the adults were out of control. Oh Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm actually grateful for my, my coping mechanism of being somebody who takes control of situations. And it, you know, became mm -hmm. a nightmare later, but it sure got me through. I had to raise younger siblings and or help with that yes. quite a bit. And right. and then also that uh, to put on a outward happy face, too. Sometimes yep. I second guess myself and go, well, maybe if I had appeared to have more significant problems, I would have gotten help. But I think at the time I grew up, not really. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I appeared to have things together and I made myself an attractive friend for, you know, the girls who were my friends and their parents would want me over. And, <laughs> and that was good. That's like a survival strategy, like be a nice kid and you'll, you'll get to stay over there a lot. And, and yeah. I had to go over there for food, frankly, you know, when I was under 10, <laughs> I, I grew up with a lot of hunger, you know, it just wasn't together. My mom right. was perfectly educated. It wasn't that. Right. It was, it I was went the to booze. <laughs> I went to friends' houses for a reprieve and everything that you're saying is so right on, you know, like we have to come up with these like fake selves, mm -hmm. the good kid, the, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or the shy one or the goofy one or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and they really keep us alive. They really keep us going, you know, or whether it's trying to get food and presenting a certain way mm -hmm. or um, I just sort of, I just wanted peace and I would go to my friend's house because they had more peaceful households. Mm -hmm. But then I'd leave in a shame attack knowing, you know what I mean? That I wasn't part of that family yeah. or, or, you know, like you just kind of, I think what sucks about this stuff, we always knew mm -hmm. in the back of our mind that we were coming from ratty families or messed up families. Mm -hmm. And that what we didn't know is that sometimes the friends that we would seek peace or food from were going through their own stuff. So yes. we also assumed it was all us. That's why I think community is so relieving or what people in the comments, just just like, oh my God, you sound, my mom sounds like your mom. But when I was 12, I literally thought that I was the only kid on the planet that had those experiences. Yes, yes. <laughs> Do you have any insight about where you think all this may be going? Now that, the, you know, so much, there's so much more knowledge suddenly available. 
do you have a vision for, I, I know you talked yeah. about like having a clearing house where we could have, you know, we could see mm -hmm. who's the therapist and actually one silver lining of the pandemic is we've learned to do, to do services on zoom. So we're freed up geographically, yep. you know, for when right. that's appropriate. Yep. Um, I have no idea where it's going, but what I do know is that, you know, when I went to therapy at 19, it was the therapist who said, read John Bradshaw about childhood stuff. So back in the day, you had to get the secret in code, <laughs> you know what I mean? To be aware of any kind of sort of thing in the restaurants that I worked at or in friendship circles in the late nineties or whatever, or with girlfriends. I mean, people might share their stories a little bit, but like, I was just so, you know what I mean? And now in a way, I love that it's almost like it's, I don't want to be generous and say it's common knowledge, but it's available knowledge that a 15 year old can watch you and I and get some ideas about maybe how to recover or what the process was like for us or whatever. Can you imagine at 15, you know, the resources for you and I, when you and I were 15 years old was like ending up in a church basement somewhere yeah. for like a youth group. Yeah. Oh know? gosh. I remember or, you know, somebody like, told me or, you should go to Alateen. And right. I remember when I was or 15, I would like, I wouldn't even dream of going to Alateen in a million years, I, you freaks, you know? <laughs> I had an aunt tell me I should go to Alateen. Really? It wasn't bad advice, but I was 15 years old. I was like, you know, guns and roses, pot smoking drummer. I'm not, I'm not going to a church basement and talk about with other loser kids yeah. about their family. No, and it's caring like it's, adults. Ew. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Or even like a, a high school guidance counselor yeah. who just tells you to be kinder to your mom. You know, like that was that was about it. Yeah. And now where I think where I see where it's going is um, there's so much more available that I think that a 20 year old can just jump on YouTube at 2 a.m. and being able to name because people have these epiphanies. They're just like, oh, my God. My mother is, you know what I mean? My mother is suffering from borderline personality yeah. disorder. That's what all that was. Yeah. Or whatever. Or my, you know, my dad's an alcoholic. And yeah. that's, I, I knew that I just have someone naming it, you know, or they can take tests or whatever. Sometimes it's too much because I have a lot of, um, like a lot of like clients who grew up in trauma. They think they're on the spectrum when they're not. Oh. You know, because they're, there's, there's too much overlapping of symptoms right. so i mean adhd and childhood trauma look mirror image to me yes just to me. and, and borderline and yeah or out. yeah like a lot of people are misdiagnosed borderline yeah or maybe they are and you know it's like it's kind of a the drawback it's a little bit messy in that way but where i think it's going is um progress is slow though mm -hmm. like do you remember like 10 years ago when we figured out that bullying was bad <laughs> <laughs> That is a social innovation that's been marvelous. You know, my kids it grew is, up in, in radically improved. There were other problems, obviously, right. but the concept we, of bullying being bad and unacceptable, they were like, oh yeah, kid, you know, I see this stuff on old 90s TV shows, that would never happen. I'm like, really? Wow, wow. Right, right. Sorry, I cut you off there. <laughs> I got excited. <laughs> I'm excited too. But yeah, but like, the progress is just kind of slow. We put a man on the moon in 69, but it wasn't until 2009 that we figured out bullying was bad. Yeah. So what I, what I would really love to see, I think, but the other side of that coin, I think that there's better parenting out there, mm -hmm. at least kind of, well, maybe at least what I sort of see in sort of communities that have the resources to be, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, but at the same time too, progress is slow. Yeah. It just takes a really, really long time, yeah. you know? Um, and I wonder if um, when that generation who's watching these videos now and can name these things and maybe get into therapy or maybe go do some healing work or whatever, um, can you imagine if our parents had done some work on themselves before they had kids? I can't even imagine it, honestly, but yeah. But yeah, I know, <laughs> theoretically, I know. yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I think that, you know, my parents, even if they were exposed to the resources, they wouldn't have been interested in them. No, I don't think mine would have either. And I, so it's I yeah, kind of I don't, I don't think, I think that's still true for a lot of people. You know, people just are where they yeah. are and they can handle what they can handle. 
But I'll tell you what is Patrick is I think that people like you or, or and me, we're, we're changing the game because the voice of survivors is not just, you know, we don't have to wait to be invited to the table, which we never were. You know, when they, yeah. every once in a while, when some like board of directors, and I, I used to work in public health, you know, and occasionally they'd have a youth representative or something. Everybody was a token, you know, and they, I never, there was just no way to be at the table to talk about that. There were a lot of assumptions. Um, and those assumptions right. have been just horrible. Like as a kid, I grew up really poor. I'd go to the doctor. They always were just, they, they'd be like, oh, white kid, fine. Parents must have everything under control. Goodbye. You know, they would never mm -hmm. question. They would yes. never ask the right questions for that. And likewise, I think they made assumptions about kids of color too, you know, conversely, like Absolutely. just assumption based. Well, now we're all at the table and that's what- Or that the kid of color doesn't need anything because they're a kid of color. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's their fault right. or, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know, right. if we cannot speak for ourselves, our voice cannot be considered in the way that we shape healthcare and mental health care. And now we, we've claimed our place at the table without their permission. <laughs> it doesn't matter yeah. whether they agree with us or want us there. We're there. We're having, we're having an influence and direct influence on each other. And with, you know, great mm. power comes great responsibility. I think, you know, not everybody who has a mm -hmm. public voice in this area is helpful. Um, but mm -hmm. everybody's going to have to find it for themselves, you know, like find the channels that really Here's something that I want to advocate for people is find something that helps you feel better now. We must feel comfort now. Um, and that this was something I tell people when they're like, what do I look for in a therapist? I'm like, don't buy the idea that it just has to feel like terrible and worse and worse forever. Like if they can't help you like feel better right away while you work on stuff that's hard, it's not a safe place. <laughs> it, yeah. Like there needs to true. be comfort there. And I think that that's true for YouTube. But the mm. thing is, is like sometimes what gets confusing is that what temporarily feels better is anger. And I think our anger has been played um, as a fake, yeah. you know, solution. Like once you get angry, it's great. It's like, no, once you get angry, it's a step up off the floor of like suicidal depression. But now what? Now where are you? How are you going to process that? And so I that's the second thing that I suggest Good to people point. is you know, don't stop at anger. Mm -hmm. Don't settle for somebody who only knows how to get you into tears and rage, you know, like help some find yes. help to become, you know, all the best right. part of you too. Right. It makes me think about it. It's so helpful. Like with the, like, say the culture of there's so much focus on narcissism. Uh -huh. I mean, it's even, sometimes even on my channel or whatever, but I try not to make it the focus. Mm -hmm. But I think like in a way that someone figures out that their parent is sort of NPD or has, you know what I mean? It is sort of, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's mm -hmm. probably a duck or whatever. But I, I worry that it stops there and people just think that to continuously name it is the healing when it's not, there's more. And I love what you sort of talked about sort of power is I think that people are more empowered now to sort of get the resources that they need. They don't need to sort of like, kiss the ring of some health insurance company yes. or some person to get the expert or whatever, when it's readily available and sometimes better mm -hmm. than coming off the mountain or something like that, you know? So I, 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 I agree with that, but also there, it makes me think about, um, you know, m in my work, I keep talking about holding our parents accountable and there's other sort of you know there's plenty of other clinicians out there or youtube personalities that sort of say um you know your parents are survivors too you have to make peace with that up front and the older i get the less opinionated i am it's like to to the viewer it's really find about to your point find the people that really resonate and work with you because Either those things my thing about holding your parents accountable until you're he until you're healed and then you can move towards forgiveness, whatever that is after the fact, you know what I mean? Like that's not going to work for everybody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that there's so much choice out there, but to your point, I think people, I get comments like sort of, well, so-and-so said this, and what do you say? And it's, I don't want to, I don't want to have that. I don't want to be there like, well, that's, that's wrong. Yeah, that's wrong. Yeah. Here's what's right. That's wrong. Yeah. Completely wrong. There's too much I of know. that in this world. It's like, it's just really what works for you and what doesn't. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Because like I've had clients, if I'm kind of say like, we, we're going to spend some time cultivating anger about what your father did, that doesn't work for everybody. 
I think it's part of it. I mean, in my experience, it is part of it, but it doesn't end there. And that's where I think, I, 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 th I think the therapists I've had have always been really good people, but some of them were, um, I don't know. I think that they didn't have an imagination for what comes after that, <laughs> that there was, yeah. they, they didn't have any tools left in their belt for now that I was angry and being like enraged is a really tough place for me to stay. Um, right. Getting there, getting there was important. I, I, I'm on the end of the spectrum of CPTSD where anger has never really been a problem. In fact, the problem is like, it's hard to like, like now come out of it. You know, that's more, that's yes. more the challenge. And I totally yeah. know people who they can't get in touch with their anger. And I, right. um, but one thing I learned um, from, you know, the woman who showed me the techniques that literally saved my life that night, it was that, it was that the anger needs to be expressed but it's not like a, it's not like a coat you wear. <laughs> it's, yeah, exactly. We can't right. get free of something we can't express. And also to have that validated, like hold your parents accountable. Those are powerful words for me to hear because it's hard mm. for me to do because it's just so, because, <laughs> because if I can't, if they did something, I can't fix it. Uh, you know, that makes me feel really helpless, yeah, right, <laughs> but right. of course in it context. has to be acknowledged. Yes. In context. Um, it's, it's sort of about holding them accountable for how they parented between zero and 18 years of age. Where <laughs> and then very magically, boom. No. <laughs> right, I know, yeah. and then, it's, then you're done. But no, I just yeah. mean for the, no, but, yeah. the perspective of that, you know, like it's, I tell people if, uh, if someone comes to me and if they're a parent mm -hmm. and they just, they get triggered by the work because they're like, I'm a terrible parent. I'm not being, you know what I mean? Like I'm not being good around my own children. I'm yeah. just, you know, like, they're not going to, you know, I really have to get them to get the perspective of you're here to be processing what your parents did, what that whole experience was like, you know, just because you're here, you're in the clear, you're already a much better parent, you're much doing so much better. Yeah, that kind of a thing. But um, holding parents accountable is a not forever thing. It's just about getting the survivor to recognize it's okay to have feelings about what happened to you. It's okay to look at the ways that they failed. No one's bad in that. Then when that's healed, we can we can look at what happened to your parents. It's just like it's more of like a step or whatever. Uh, but most people lose interest in it. So it's it is a really complicated thing. But something you said earlier made me also think about um I lost it, but um maybe it'll come maybe it'll come back to me. So place at the table, but, parents, yeah. Yeah. But well, that's that's, that's very therapy. powerful for me. Um you're you're helping me see just right there, like I have trouble holding my parents accountable because it's so painful, really. And, yeah, and right. it's a phenomenon I recognize in myself and I recognize it in so many people who I've coached is it's a little scary to put down your defense mechanisms. It just feels like everything's going to oh, go out sure. of control. For a lot of people, it is anger. Anger is a protection. It's, it's a boundary sure. before you have really mm -hmm. like clever boundaries, you know, really nuanced right. boundaries. Just to be an angry person and go, everybody just get away. You know, that's right. a boundary. <laughs> Right. When I ask a client to not codependently protect their parents uh, about what they did or make excuses for them, I'm asking them to jump in a pool and they don't know how to swim. That's those defenses. You know what I mean? I, it's where, so that's why I go slow with people or, or whatever. Yeah. But if I'm, if I'm asking a very, very codependent person to who never brings anything up, to bring something up with me or a group member or their partner, I'm asking them to jump in a pool without any floaties on, without the knowledge of how to swim. Like that's how protective these sort of things are. And I think this is what I was, what I forgot earlier is I think the therapist who might get you to anger and then there's no follow-up is I just think that, you know, in a way that they, they, they don't know what they don't know. You know what I mean? Like uh, there's so many sort of therapists out there that, you know what I mean? Like, well, you've talked about it. Good for you. You know what I mean? You've opened up some doors here. And I just sort of like, again, just really grateful for my mentor because she had a process of starting and stopping and you know what I mean? And so it's sort of like, there's a, there's even a syllabus to the group work that I do that comes from her. So I just think that therapists who kind of are, are in that, it's not like they're bad. It's, I just think that they just don't, it's hard to explain, but they just don't know what they don't know, you know? They don't, they never have really looked at, oh, you can have a client hit the bag and work on their rage work. 
you can have a client like do empty chair work with their with their mother who is sexually off around them. You can do this or you can do that. So it's just sort of, but I also think coming back to that from the mountaintop is a lot of people are like, whoa, you're really going to activate people. And part of that is true, you know, but part of like, yes, but that's the point and to have a different outcome towards the end of it. But again, it's, it's, we don't do that right out of the gates. Uh, this has been a long conversation and you, that is something yeah. I've always been meaning to ask you when you talk about sexually off, I, that's a phrase I hadn't heard before, but I, I think I know what you mean. And it's so significant people who are sexually right. off around you when you're like, a kid. Yeah. Like mom goes through a divorce and she's making out with men on the couch while you're in the den. You know what I mean? And you're eight and there's no process around the divorce, you know, or the classic thing that is rampant. And I think you, you, I, I, from what I know in American culture is, you know, before the internet, I feel like every kid found a stack of Playboys or video cassettes that they weren't protected from. And that's another version of being sexually off. Yeah. 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 Oh, I could, I, I, that's, we could do a whole video about that. Right. <laughs> and way more common than we think. Yeah. You know, like 70s and 80s and 90s and 50, wild, wild ride. Oh, the 70s were a mess yeah. because at the time yeah. there was kind of an idea, like, actually this is healthy for the kids, you know, to stop being so yeah. like oh. puritanical about this stuff, you know, sex is normal, right. nudity, um, no big deal. We had naked people around the house. Right. And, uh, Com like, yeah, communal stuff and whatever, yeah. you know. Yeah. Then, then we're watching Brady Bunch where it's not that. You know? <laughs> that was one of my famous moments in childhood. I was eight and I came in and um, to my mom and my stepdad to be at that time. And I came in and I was crying and upset about things. And I, and they, she was just like, what, what? And I just said, why can't we be like the Brady Bunch? And they just thought that was so funny because in their value system, that was just stupid, oh, fake yeah. Americana, everything that you needed to run away from. And I've watched right. it since then. I showed it to my kids and they're like, this show is so dumb. And I'm like, yeah, I guess it is. But to me, it was an anchor I could go into, you know, just a Brady like, Bunch saved my life. Yeah, Brady Bunch. Laura Ingalls Wilder, the little house books. Those were like mm -hmm. my lifeblood of and and they've influenced yep. me greatly creatively mm -hmm. and spiritually yep. and yeah. And the parenting that we'd get from watching like tonight on a very special growing pains. <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, we're like sort of like like an issue would yeah. come up, like one of the kids smoked pot in the woods or whatever yeah. and was caught by the guidance counselor. And then <laughs> the parents had an actual sane conversation around it. like that's, you know, that was like an anchor for me. Yeah. You know, and sort of, and for, from what I learned from my clients for all of them too. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, to this day, you TV know? is how I learn how you have good communication with people. <laughs> <laughs> There's certain shows I'm really into Ted Lasso right, right now and the way he can just have so much levity and compassion with people who are being jerks. I'm, I'm like totally yes. clocking this. I'm like, okay, how do you do this? Right. Absolutely. You know, like I've only seen like little segments of that, but I got to get into that show just because, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And all the feel good shows, the show parenthood for a long time, you know, I would watch like, how are you supposed mm -hmm. to have, how are you supposed to have conversations? And it's like, oh, first you say something to indicate that you heard what somebody said. Then you yeah. show them a little empathy for it. Although Ironically, when in my former career, I did a lot of, um, I, I trained teams of workers to do better customer service and patient experience. And so I, I, mm -hmm. I had to know what are these bullet points for what to do because I had to teach myself. I was totally feral in terms of how do you have difficult conversations? How do you express yourself in a way that's paced right. and considerate and at the right kind of emotional tenor yep. and brr. <laughs> I would start out trying to be civil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I end up like an angry, like beaker from the Muppets. Do you know what I mean? Like, just like sort of like, but that's how my family talked. I've never like, get that out of my head now, I'm beaker like, from the Muppets. Well, I just think I'm like, blah, 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 you know? <laughs> there's an author um, who he wrote the book, No More Mr. Nice Guy, which I, I think is a really valuable book. And he talks about it. Mm -hmm. He talks about something called victim puke. <laughs> and I, that victim puke. <laughs> And I read oh, right sure. away. And what it is, is like a codependent person put, you know, takes the victim blow again and again. And it's like, I mean, I'm not going to say anything. I, I, I never complain. I don't push back. I just go along nicely. Yeah. And then one day it's like, <laughs> a yeah. victim puke. that's a thing. 
very destructive totally... to relationships. I can testify. Better to right. communicate along the way, and and mm -hmm. <laughs> so much right. good thing. Everything good in life depends on being able to do that. Right. I think that what that victim puke thing, it just makes me think about my own childhood. And I know we got to wrap up in a second is that um, uh, it would, you know, in a way, I think we repress, we take it, we don't say anything because it's futile. Yeah. But then I think we hit this not today Satan kind of moment mm -hmm. and we lose it. But yes. the way that we do that becomes like um, self-filling prophecy yes. kind of a thing. And people like, oh, Patrick, how could you, you know, like that kind of a thing. Yeah. And it's just sad the way that that's on cycle. Repress, blow up, repress, blow up. Blowing up is a little bit like, a, it's just like the methamphetamine of emotions. It's, it's, a quick, yeah. it's a quick escape from what you're feeling, you know, and a feeling of yeah. empowerment and self-assertion followed by sure. periods of remorse and, you know, decay. Right. It just, it's, a, it's a quick hit. And so like, like so many things in life, it's, it's just not mm. wholesome. And re it's, it takes true healing to start to learn how to handle all yeah. the inevitable improv improvisations of life in a way that's totally. truer to yourself and honest, but, and yet caring, honest, caring, true. Totally. Right. Um, lastly, as my mentor would say that, you know, it's like when she was teaching me about triggers, she would say, well, being self-righteous is a sign that you're triggered. Oh, interesting. Very interesting. That blew my, that blew my mind. So if you were, if you were like late to this and I was self righteous and I was just like well, uh, well I, you know I showed up at twelve yeah <laughs> you know yeah. you get that like I'm using it as a weapon but it's a sign that I'm defending against something up and something is up with the person's childhood when they become that self righteous and you could see it all over social media all over that's not there's nothing zen about it. There's nothing fair or mature or balanced. I mean, we do have the right to be angry, but I love seeing someone um, modeling healthy anger without being like passive aggressive about yeah. it or whatever. I think that I think that that is actually more powerful. Yeah. When someone can be in charge of their anger, as opposed to kind of being a mess about it. But like where, where the, the nature of the trigger is usually most clients, including myself, when we're self-righteous in our head, like with our partners, like, of course you didn't get the Nutella. I mean, if I can only put on the list like 12 times, just pick up the Nutella. Like that's just one of those fights in our head, self-righteous rants. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it's coming from that earlier disappointment from childhood. Of course you didn't fucking pick me up from soccer. I never get what I want. Right? No one cares. Yeah. Soccer. Yeah, no one cares. No one cares. Yeah. Yeah. Those little mantras that come in, those little triggered mantras that come mm -hmm. in are a cue. And I know it's good yeah. to know them. My, one of mine is, I don't need you. I don't need anybody. If I'm oh, thinking classic. that thought, time to stop, drop, <laughs> use the tools. Yeah. Anything that comes out of right. my mouth after I'm thinking that is not going to be good. Yes. Right. Or when you're this close to like a Sopranos, you're dead to me. <laughs> You're dead to me. <laughs> like, like that's a that's a thing for childhood trauma survivors. You know what I mean? I like they're that. falling in love with somebody, and four months into the relationship, the person says, "Oh, I have to reschedule." Who needs you? Yeah. <laughs> dead to me. I love it. Oh, there's so many things we could talk about. Well, this was this was wonderful. I love that we connected. I love your channel, and I love what you're doing. And let's do this again. I never run out of things to be curious about your work, Patrick, because you have this gift to to talk about things that are real and powerful, and it like touches me, and I think, oh, here comes my feelings, and then you 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 have a way of like keeping anything from just going out of control. It just gets guided into an insight. Plus, you're funny as hell. This beaker. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I love, I love people who are funny. It makes it possible to take in information that uh, there's no other mm. way I could. <laughs> mm. It makes it comfortable. And I could do this for hours. Yeah, me too. Me too. Well, we have, we've had such fun mm. conversations, so let's definitely do it again. I, um, I want right. to make sure people know where to find you. It's Patrick T-N-T-E-A-H-A-N on YouTube. And mm -hmm. your videos are just flying out of the stratosphere right now. They're doing so well. You are really hitting a nerve. And, and I'm so impressed with you and proud of you and happy to be your friend. And I love talking with you. You're just like really fun and easy to talk to. 
And I always had that experience when someone is really authentic. And what I really love about it is that, you know, you're sharing your story as well. Do you know what I mean? It's just, you're just so human. And I have a confession to make is sort of like when I started my channel, I would look at look at your channel and kind of go like, like, how does she do that? Like, how does she, you know what I mean? Like, this just like sort of like, and I was also super relieved that somebody was also not only talking about childhood, but it was in the title, it's in the name of your channel. And I was sort of like immediately drawn to it. So I love that we just like sort of like, we're just really kind of like, like talking about the same thing. Yeah. People need to hear this. It's easy to imagine having been friends back in the day, but of course. Absolutely. <laughs> right. We would have been ripping butts behind the cafeteria. <laughs> I, know. I know. I've put all the links to Patrick's things right in the description section below. So if you missed me telling it, don't worry. You can open up the description section and find it there and link directly to his his website, his YouTube channel, and his courses. Patrick and I have each made our own videos based on some long conversations here, and you're going to want to see Patrick's video. Definitely get over to his YouTube channel and check that out.